Hi. I'm Dr. Sam Hazeldean, founder of MedWorld. Today I'm really excited to be back speaking with Dr. Gareth Andrews and Dr. Richard Stevenson. Last time I spoke to these guys, they were about to head uh, to the North Pole. This time, they're about to do the longest ever unsupported ski crossing of Antarctica via the South Pole by an Australian or New Zealander. It's 2,023 kilometres um, while collecting climate data along the way. So a huge undertaking ahead of them. Welcome, guys. Hi, Sam. It's great to be here. Hey, Sam. Thanks for having us on. Oh, it's fantastic to have you here, guys. Look, the first question I think is, you know, a really important one is, what on earth are you thinking? Well, I think, you know, you can't be sensible all the time. And, uh, you know, it's we, we always try and have these these big goals or these big projects that we're, that we're working on. And uh, over the last 10 years that Rich and I have been going on these adventures together, um, this is the big one. You know, this is the one that we've been building towards. And... Uh, it's going to be a historic achievement when we get all the way across Antarctica. Uh, it's going to be a huge one. And I, I, I fully support that we can't be sensible all the time. I'm sitting here with a fractured calcaneus right now from just recently hitting a 65 foot ski jump poorly. So uh, you, you're preaching to the choir. Look, tell, tell me a little bit about, you know, why do you, each of you tell us a little bit about yourselves um, and, and I guess how you got to this place, how you got into this. Rich, why don't you go first? Um, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, so I'm, um, you know, by trade, I'm an emergency physician. I work uh, over here in Dunedin uh, in New Zealand. Um, moved out from the UK about 10 years ago because I, I kind of love the mountains, I love the outdoors, I love my skiing, I love my climbing, I love my biking. And uh, New Zealand is a, a perfect country for me to come and live in. And, uh, you know, really over the last oh, 10 or 15 years, really, it's been a case of, you know, trying to get that right balance between my medical career, which I'm passionate about, but also just having other things to my life and maintaining those passions about being up in the mountains, out in the wilderness, up in the wild, cool, remote parts of the world, and trying to sort of find that right sweet spot uh, and, and balance my, my career, uh, my two passions in life, really, which are, you know, my career and the, and the, and the wilderness and the outdoors. Awesome. We'll talk more about that a little bit more later as well. And Gareth, what about you? I'm an anaesthetist here in Sydney and um, look, I've, through my whole medical career, I've, I've tried to use, um, use medicine to pursue the things that I really enjoy and, and that's getting outside and exploring, you know, exploring the world around us. And, and so, you know, expedition medicine is a great way of doing that. So that was really my, my window or my way into to this world and, you know, over the years, since I was a kid, the polar regions have always, you know, they're, they're so wild and beautiful and untamed and they've held this, this real mystery for me and they, and they keep drawing us back. So, you know, it's been um, over the last, you know, 10 years really we've, we've been building to, um, to getting to Antarctica and, and this project. It's a huge, huge undertaking. Look, why don't you tell us, you know, tell us about what was the journey. Tell us about what you're about to undertake. 2,023 kilometres across, um, the, you know, Antarctica via the South Pole. I mean, it's, 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 it's an immense undertaking. You know, tell us about it and, you know, what did it take to get here? So it's really, I mean, the idea between me and Rich it was conceived about 10 years ago on our first expedition to the North Pole. Um, and then over the last three years, we've been planning it meticulously, really. And it's taken us three years to get to this point. So our journey will start on the edge of the Weddell Sea um, on the shores of Birkner Island. Um, from there, we'll, we'll ski across Birkner Island and then the Ronnie Filchner Ice Shelf um, to the base of the Pensacola Mountains. And we'll find our, a route up through the mountains, um, up one of the big glaciers to the Polar Plateau. And once we're on the polar plateau, we will have gone from sea level to around 3,000 meters. And it's when the, the temperatures really plummet. You know, they go from sort of an average of minus 10 to minus 20 to minus 30, minus 40 with mm. big, big winds and big storms. And, and then our sleds will be about 160 kilos. So we'll have everything we need to survive for the entire journey right from the start. And so you're you carrying, know, you're, you're, you're tying everything that you need for this trip. Everything, yeah. All our food, all our fuel, all our safety equipment, 
um, so everything. So we'll have no outside help while while we're uh, while we're on the crossing. And, and once we get to the South Pole, we'll turn towards the Transantarctic Mountains and uh, and the Reedy Glacier, and um, and uh, you know the other side of Antarctica. Yeah, and and you know th this is not you know a, a Sunday stroll. Like this is a serious expedition. W what are the risks? What do you what do you what what most concerns you about this? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, you know, there's, there's no doubt that we're going to be going into, you know, in a really, a really hostile environment. Um, you know, the, the temperatures that you're constantly exposed to mean that it's, it's just a difficult environment to survive in. It's, it's, it's just, it's, a, it's, it's depleting all the time. You know, you're just constantly struggling to stay cold. There's a constant risk of frostbite or, you know, you know from minor to severe sort of cold freezing injuries. Um, you know, a few moments in attention in temperatures like minus 40 or with a bit of wind can cause you significant problems. So, you know, it is a really challenging environment to, to operate in. But, you know, I guess we're, we're, so I think really the key challenge is survival and is covering the distance. You know, the big challenge of this is we've got a, we've got about 75 days to cover 2000 kilometers. So you're looking at, you know, we need to be averaging 27K a day moving our sleds at start as Gareth said of 150 160 kilos so we're going to be slower at the beginning and we've got to get our heads around that and then we're going to be faster as we get towards the end and we get lighter and faster and more efficient but that's gonna that's where the danger of this expedition comes from it, it's not necessarily about life and limb you know touch wood you know the risk of us falling off something risk of falling down a crevasse there is real but really it's about survival it's about complete covering the distance staying fit strong and healthy in in such an extreme um, challenging environment whilst covering all of that distance so the risk really is one of, of failure i suppose and and, and um, just taking too much of a hammering um, that our bodies just can't stand up to it and we can't make it across um, and then of course there's always the risks of you know equipment failure you know we've got one tent with us you know if that tent is our little life cell that keeps us alive in this hostile environment if that rips or blows away and it's game over um, and, and I suppose we are lucky to live in a modern era of relatively good communications and satellite phones and we've got a pretty robust rescue plan so if the worst comes to the worst you know we will you know hopefully be at most a few days from being from being rescued but you know, there's certainly a time of this expedition where we'll be some of the most remote human beings on the planet and you know if something bad were to happen we've got to look after ourselves for uh, a reasonably extended period of time but yeah, I guess, you know, that's the challenge. It's the, it's the survival in that environment for such a long period of time and covering such a long distance is, is uh, yeah, it's going to test us, I think, isn't it, mate? You yeah. could say that, yeah. It certainly is. Do you think, do you think actually uh, in those sort of environments being a doctor is an advantage? Yeah, look, I think it's a massive advantage. On such a long expedition, um, and as Richard Said, you know the the arduous nature of it. We're we're under going to be un, under duress for a long time, and and it's it's the little things that will that will get us. You know, it's it's like Rich said that the the dangers of falling in crevasses are there, but we're we're more likely to get you know skin infection, chest infections, musculoskeletal injuries that will end the expedition rather than rather than something major happening. And I think being doctors will give us an advantage because we'll be able to preempt, diagnose and, and treat things like, you know, in, infected blisters and the, the, the beginnings of, um, of chest infections and those sorts of things. We'll be able to, to treat, uh, assess and treat musculoskeletal injuries before they, uh, before they become a real problem. Um, and also we'll, we'll be able to, in the more extreme circumstances, we'll be able to, um, you know, keep an eye on each other and, and really know when when it's when it's something serious from a medical perspective rather than just fatigue and 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 just general wear and tear, and those sorts of things come towards the end of the expedition. You know, when we're really pushing hard, we're trying to make you know big days like long days, big kilometres, um, and we're just driving for home. It's it's that, that, those times that we'll be at risk of, of pushing too hard and something bad happening. And I think yeah. being, have being two of us and, and both being doctors will will um, will be much safer from, from that perspective. Yeah, makes total sense. Sounds like, I mean, it sounds like it 
it's a real team effort. Talk to me about those team dynamics and how you've built those and how important that is when you're out on the, on the pole or on the ice. Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we've been, um, uh, you know, a team for quite a long time now, really. Right? We're, we're, we're actually brother-in-law. My, my partner is, is Gareth's sister. And, you know, so we've known each other for a long time, but we've only really got to know each other really well through doing this sort of thing together. And I think, you know, one of the key things about, you know, Gareth mentioned we've been preparing for this for, you know, for 10 years, really. Um, and one of the key things that's happened over that time is that we've been on different expeditions together. We, you know, ski to the Magnetic North Pole, We've crossed Iceland, Garrasfield across Greenland. We've been in, up in the in the, in the uh, uh, Norwegian Arctic Islands in Svalbard recently. We've been in these tough circumstances together. We've shared a tent together for a long period of time. We've been in some really tough conditions. We've made difficult decisions together, um, and all of that has, has shown us that as a team that we're kind of ready because we've tested ourselves in this sort of environment. Um, and I think you know, there's no way that you could be doing something like this, I don't think, without somebody that you knew intimately well and that you'd already had these shared experiences together. And you know that when the going gets tough, we just know that we naturally tend to look after each other. You know, on this sort of trip, everybody's got good days, everybody's got bad days. And we know that we tend to be almost sort of slightly out of sync with that. And we're really good at helping each other. When one's down, the other one of us can, can, can bring us up. And we also know that our, our approach to stress, to emergencies, to difficult decisions is really similar. And so rather than there being a conflict there, it, you know, there's a sort of synergy and it works really well. Um, and I guess, you know, we're comfortable that we we know that dynamic works because we've been there and done it before. Yeah, incredible. It's like any good relationship, isn't it? You know, everyone's going to have good days and bad days, but you can't have bad days at the same time. <laughs> Exactly. You've almost, yeah. you almost got to realise whose turn it is sometimes, don't you? And uh, yeah. Act, yeah. act accordingly. Look, obviously this is, I mean, the undertaking to get ready and then to do this is huge. And you've got clinical workloads on top of that. Um, how does this impact your well-being? Does it help it? Does it challenge it? Like, talk to me about that. For me, personally, it, it, it helps massively. You know, both Rich and I are, have full-time stressful clinical loads, being um, you know in, in anaesthetics and uh, and emergency medicine, um, and it can be it can become all-consuming, and so the we find a release through through our adventures, and and especially this this big project when we when we you know set set our attention to to the expedition rather than our work. It's um, you know, it's uh, it's a welcome distraction. It's something, you know, exciting and and um, and just very different to, to look forward to. And and it's us following what we what what, what we're most passionate about. And it, and I think it um, it's really important for um, for us to, to have that. And um, you know, and that and there are so many skills that are transferable across you know across from our clinical work into our into our expedition work and. And um, and the synergy there is really really nice. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's go Richard. Yep. No, no, sorry, sorry Sam. I, no, I was just, just going to say it's that. I think for me it's so important that you, you know, all doctors are passionate about medicine. You know, you don't you don't get through medical school and get into particularly you know as far as being a specialist of some description without that passion and commitment, that interest in it. But you know, we're a speciality that is, we're a, a profession that is at high risk of burnout. I know as an emergency physician, I'm in a speciality that is at high risk of burnout in a profession that's at high risk of burnout. You know, it's it's about recognizing that and going, what it, what else is in my life that is I can be passionate about, that stimulates me, that can be really different, can be really healthy, um, physically and psychologically, and making sure that you kind of proactively go out there and go, I am gonna, as a even as a doctor, I'm still gonna have this other part of my life that is something else, that's different, that I can commit myself to, and I can do cool things, uh, and I can be passionate about that's separate to medicine, um, and that's that's a, that's a tricky balance practically to achieve. But if you if you get it right, I think it can be a really healthy thing. Yeah, I, th I think you're you're so. I mean, you're so right. And if, I was thinking that this the other day actually as. Really, Adam Case, but you know this is going to hurt. And I was thinking about it, and reflecting that 
you know, when, when we give ourselves completely over to medicine, like, you know, devote everything and make it the one pillar of our life, there's a real risk there that if that pillar's not going well, like we're having a bad, you know, a bad, you know, patients live, patients die, we have good days, we have bad days. If we don't have other pillars in which to sort of support our lives, then, you know, we become quite at risk. Um, what tips, I mean, this is, you, you, you're demonstrating that, you know, not everyone has to go to the South Pole and the North Pole to keep their other interests alive. So you're demonstrating the extreme, you know, literally um, and figuratively end of the spectrum. Well, what sort of, I guess, tips would you give other doctors to, to keep up their interests? I mean, you, you're absolutely right, you know. People who do medicine are high achievers, and you know almost everyone. And, and you think back to your med class; they, they're they're also good at you know they've got something else. They're good at sport. They're good at music. They're like they're just gifted. They're, they're they're very talented people. What tips would you have for other doctors? You know, obviously you've spoken to the importance, but I guess on how do they actually keep prioritizing those other things and making time for them? I think in in our experience. It's been that um, it's often difficult to, to make that first step into into giving yourself time to to do your other activities and and when you make that first step and you talk to your colleagues about it and maybe you need to restructure shifts or or restructure how you're working um, I have always been um, you know blown away by the support of the people around me and and it's always been a bit of a worry that that there's this, you know, there's often this underlying theme in medicine that it should be your only, your only interest, your only path, and 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 that's not quite true. And and so, people have been remarkably supportive as soon as I've, you know, suggested these these projects. And and I think that's the first thing is is just taking that first step and and then just breaking it down and looking at it, and and making, you know, making. Um, a plan as to how you can bring those other interests into into your um, into your life al alongside medicine, mm -hmm. um, and and then just sur surrounding yourself with like-minded and, and positive people. Like if you talk to you know, talk to your friends and family about about these sorts of things, I mean, they will be no doubt overwhelmingly positive about you. You know, continuing to to um, to follow your passions and then just to, to an extent just ignoring the people that say that, that medicine should be your only focus because because at the end of the day you've got to look after you. That's a, that's a really interesting point actually that we all, you know, I think a lot of us assume that the prevailing uh, um, the prevailing thinking is it should be your entire focus. What's really interesting is when you make something else a priority as you say People actually support it. Um, maybe it's a mis you know it might have been this is what it was like, but actually it's now a mistaken mm -hmm. assumption. If you still believe that you're going to be judged, and you know you're going to be you know not progress your career and all that sort of stuff um, because you prioritise the stuff, it actually might just be a mistaken thing that you know. I think you know people like yourselves, myself, a lot of doctors. There's a different generation who actually. Who, who do see the importance of it, isn't there? Mm. I, I think that's I think that's a really, really good point. And I think I think the other part of that is that it's, you know, we can be that change. You know, we can be the new generation of senior doctors who support our junior doctors to do that. You know, Gareth and I have been doing this sort of stuff since we were junior doctors, but we're now both consultants. I'm head of the department. You know, we're that new generation mm. that says, actually, when one of my registrars comes to me, and says, I want to take six months off to go traveling. I want to go climbing in the Himalayas and do some of the stuff. I'm like, good on you, mate. You go for it. And we'll get you back into training and support you when you come back. You know, and I think that's, you know, that's a really positive thing in medicine. I hope that that's, that's recognizing that that is a valid goal in life, as well as being a good doctor, because I do think you can do both. And in some respects, you serve your patients and your career and your speciality better by not burning out at the age of 50 because you've just flown too close to the sun and actually it turns out you're not immortal after all despite what you felt the expectations were um, and you know we can have longer and healthier 
careers, which are ultimately better for both us and our patients. Um, that's certainly that's how I see it. That's a, I mean, that's a really good point. It's, uh, and isn't it interesting as you go through your career and at, at some point you're no longer the junior doctor and you're now the uh, in the position to actually affect change. Um, um, and it sort of can sneak up on you, can't it? But but actually, you know, <laughs> we are all in that position. And I guess, you know, to your point, what I took from that, you know, that one part is live by example, so do it for yourself. Um, the other part is support you know, those junior doctors when they have those requests um, and they prioritise, you know, the important over just the urgent and, and, you know, you're a head of department, so part of you has got to be going, oh, now I've got someone to fill, but on the other hand, you've got to go, but I'm much better off having a doctor who's in a good state who comes back and doesn't just, you know, leave for good. Um, what, else, what else can this generation, our generation, do to usher in this type of change, do you think? Look, I think it's um. I think there's a you know there's a there's a huge push at the moment in medicine to be to be supportive of our colleagues, and and I think this is a this is another thing with the emerging generation of of um of younger consultants and heads of departments and things, and um, you know, it's burnout and fatigue has has often been the been the problem because people, you know, they feel like. They're the only ones going through this process. You know, they're the only ones feeling like their specialist exams are just taking, taking a huge toll, or their clinical workload is taking a huge toll. But you know, actually, in fact, we're all in it together. You know, and it's just that um, that change for 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 medicine to become, I, I suppose, um, a, a united um, a united speciality or, or, or career option where we just um where we where we help help each other through because it's because it's it's uh, it's never it's never plain sailing whatever element or part of medicine you're in there will always be hard times um and um and it's important to be to, to all be united as a as a medical fraternity yeah, I, t I totally agree. I, I saw actually something on Instagram yesterday, a doctor who started this thing called Post Your Pill. Um, and essentially it's, you know, just take a photo of, you know, of, of you know, antidepressant or whatever, you know, it's, it, it's you know, um, psychological health stuff. But I thought that was actually really quite powerful for a doctor to be saying, you know, I'm not superhuman, um, I've needed help, and, and just making it, you know, by doing that, you, you maybe make it okay for someone else to go and seek help or for someone else not to feel ashamed that they went through depression. I mean, I've been, I've, you know, been through it myself and at times and, and needed antidepressants to kind of get out of that hole and then you can get onto the more psychotherapy stuff to kind of get beyond that. But it's, um, you know, so many of us think we just go through it and we're the only ones, don't we? Yeah, I think it's about it's about talking about it. It's about sharing it, and it's about it's how you change the culture. Is that you just you just talk about it, you talk about it openly, you do it, um, and you normalise it. And I think as a profession, we need to do that to make being a doctor sustainable. It's a pretty challenging career. We all work, live and work in challenging health systems for a variety of reasons wherever you are in the world. Um, and you know, as a as a you know united group of doctors. Um, we have the power to change it. We just have to um, almost like not make it worse for ourselves. You know, if, if if you're getting, you know, if you're if you're the pervading culture where you work is that you've just got to give everything um, to your job, um, or else you're failing. You can just have the courage to challenge it. You know, have the courage courage to um, you know call it out and say that it's not okay. And as Gareth says, I think you'll be surprised how many people. We're only pretending to be like that, and actually, they feel the same as you. Yeah, mm. that's. I think that's pretty cool for people. Well, I think, um, Sorry, go. Yeah, very. Yeah, very much so. And I think also, um, you know, Rich and I now are, you know, we've we've, we've finished our, our training and we're and we're consultants. But I think the, the point is here, and, and Rich made it before, is that um, you know we've been doing this stuff. 10 years through all our from from when we were interns all the way through now through our specialist training and so I don't want people to think that um, oh, it's all it's all 
well and good for you guys because you you're finished and you can almost structure your your um, specialist practice to to what you want to do. Um, you know, we really we really worked quite quite hard as in terms of residents and and training registrars to still fit in the the things that we really wanted to do. So when we went to the North Pole and um, you know Greenland and, and Iceland and and they, and they're the really the times where just just reaching out and suggesting the concept of taking six weeks out to go on an adventure to the to your head of department who's probably you know big and scary and and um your boss and things and but in actual fact um you'd be surprised that that how supportive are the, the people are around you and it doesn't have to be a big adventure you know you can take six six weeks off to to, to join an, to go to join an orchestra and, and and tour in Europe or or join whatever it is that 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 um, you love doing um, it, it, you know it's possible either, even even when you're feeling the weight of your your training years when you certainly live that by example I remember that you fit in going to the North Pole in between exams so um, it, you're definitely leading by example and showing what's possible and, you know, I guess being that next generation that, you know, we do, if we don't like what we've inherited um, with some extent, then we actually have the chance to change it now, don't we? Um, you know, we had one and two doctors in burnout, research I did recently, it's two and three now, like it's got worse, but we have a chance to actually impact it and change it for the better, and you're certainly living that by example. Now, beyond that example, you know, what else are you hoping to achieve um, with, this, with this expedition? And hey, Sam, I'm, I'm really sorry. Just after talking about um, work-life balance and stuff, I'm, I'm squeezing this interview whilst I'm working clinically, and I, I, I actually gonna have to go. I'm really you sorry. You go, Rich. I've kind of I've pushed it a bit far, but it's, it's really good to speak to you. And thanks very much for getting on board and supporting us. It well, thank you for taking uh, the time. I know you've got a busy department out there. And uh, mm -hmm. look, look, all the very, very best. I'll finish. I'll to finish talking with Gareth. But look, yeah. uh, thank you for squeezing us in, and, and and what an example. Thank you, Rich. Yeah. All right. Thanks, mate. See right, you. Cheers, Thanks, mate. See you later. Gareth, yeah, what, I was just saying, you know, what, what else are you hoping to achieve by, by you know, for this? Obviously, there's, there's a personal, um, uh, you know, uh, um, challenge and satisfaction. You've got, you know, living by example for your junior doctors. Anything else? Yeah, look, Rich and I love, um, you know, we love the, the natural world and, and we spend as much time as we can in, in the world's wild places. So we do feel like we have a responsibility to, you know, to conserve what we, to what we love. Um, and, and, and to that end, we are, you mentioned at the start, we're collecting climate data as we, as we go across the continent. So it'll be the longest, um, longitudinal research, climate research, um, since, since Scott and his Terra Nova expedition. So, wow. so on, on Scott's Terra Nova expedition, they essentially it was the first expedition to the Antarctic that, that got a significant amount of scientific data that's still used today um, as the basis of a, of a lot of meteorological um, work in Antarctica and oceanographic work. Um, and look, we've got 75 days to collect climate data every day. So our sleds are our mobile climate stations, essentially collecting everything from, you know, air temperatures, snow conditions, cloud cover, sastrugi heights and all, all sorts of things. And all the data will go to the Australian um, Antarctic program to help them build climate models of now. And then from that, they can they can extrapolate that into the future. Um, and and look how our climate is changing and, and what we can do to mitigate that. Um, and so it, it'll be we're hoping to leave a lasting contribution to, to climate science and, and, you know, make an effort to combat climate change into the future. Um, and through Scouts Australia and Scouts New Zealand, um, you know, we're working with them to, to try and inspire the younger generations to care about Antarctica, to get excited, to get excited, excited about it and to show them that, you know, they've got the opportunity to be the custodians of our planet into, into the future. Um, and I remember when I was 
you know, I was at school, I can't remember how old I was, but a team had just been to the North Pole and they came and talked to us about their expedition and things and the research they were doing there. And, and it just, it just lit that, it lit that fire. And I just thought I'm, I'm going to go and do that. And, you know, young people are amazing. You, you know, if you plant a seed, you never know what's going to come from it. Um, so putting all that together, we, I think we can, there's, there's some really important things that can come out of this project. I think that's, that's incredible. I mean, it's incredible that, um, we're still operating off, uh, climate data, um, that Scott's, um, got about, I mean, when was that? How many, how long ago was that? It was his, nine, it was his 1910 expedition. So 110 years you know, ago. Yeah, 110 but, years ago. I mean, it'd be so interesting to see what's changed. Um, and I guess, you know, not, not a lot of people are prepared to go and spend 75 days on the ice down there. So, you know, that longitudinal data is going to be something that doesn't, you, they don't get a lot. So I can imagine it's going to make a huge difference. And as you say, I think, you know, and I have to come back to the doctors and things as well. I think this living by example is just such an important part of ushering in different change, you know, planting a seed. Because, you know, you never know what's going to grow. You never know. Um, you know, which consultant might impact you, you know, and then help you make a positive decision or whatever, you know, going into the future. Gareth, I mean, I just think it's incredible what you guys have done um, and are doing and are about to embark upon. I think, I mean, what an incredible uh, adventure. And, and the way you approach it, though, with such pragmatism to, you know, reducing the risks, you know, maximizing the upside, you know, from an impact perspective. Um, I've just got a huge amount of respect. So I just think, you know, I, and I'm sure anyone listening to this wishes you the very, very best as well. We'll be following your adventure through Midworld. So, you know, whoever's listening can, we'll be giving, I think you're sending out daily updates that we'll be publishing and um, really excited about that. Um, so look, you know, thanks for taking the time, um, fitting us in between everything. Um, what an adventure. Oh, look, thanks, Sam. And, and um, thank you for giving us the opportunity to, to make a positive in, impact on the medical profession and, uh, and to do something for our colleagues through, through the expedition. And, um, you know, we, we really appreciate all your support for, you know, what we've, what we've done in the past and, uh, and what we're about to do. It's, um, you know, it, uh, it means a massive deal to us. Oh, look, it's, our, it's a privilege to be involved from afar. All right. Cheers, Thanks. Sam. Thank you. All the best. Get it done.